Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, I, I like to walk around a bit during my talks. Um, so this talk is about open source contributor automation. I think it will be especially interesting for you if you are a maintainer of an open source project and you want to attract more people. At the same time, you don't want to be burning out on helping all those new people getting started. So you kind of need to, um, to build an open source self-service machine out of your open source project. Because um, well, if you think like a startup, you can, uh, you can make newcomers help each other and grow on that. So that's actually a, a very good win-win situation that you can create there. So um, wh why do I think I could do this talk? Um, I am the founder of the Koala Open Source Project. And uh, with the Koala Open Source Project, something interesting happened last year. So basically, in the beginning of last year, <coughs> We had something like four to six contributors, um, like total. And at the end of last year, we had over 300. Um, so this is the contributors per month graph. Um, and I think there's, um, this one is interesting. Because this is what you, what you might want to have happen to your open source project. Um, so, this tiny one is a GSOC. This is a Google Summer of Code. It's a lot of work. It gets you people on long term, but only a small number of people. And this is actually a, a hackathon um, organized by a company. They did like lots of advertisement, and lots of people came, and lots of people go. So the spike also means like lots of work, and also lots of wasted work in a, in a way. Um, but still, like both initiatives have ha have helped us grow a lot, and if you take events like those, um, like those will get students to see your project. And um, what I'm going to do now is I have like um, ten uh, ten things, like concrete things that you can do to make your project more newcomer friendly. Um, I'm going to present those. Um, there will be quotes below those. Um, statements that I do, which are usually from our community. So you have like a second voice. Um, and it, it will help you use those things because once, once that happens, uh, what happens then is that like the word spreads and your community gets acknowledged as a newcomer friendly uh, community. And people join you because of that, because they want to help open source projects and they don't really know how to start. Um, so I think the first thing that you can do is introducing issue levels. And what we did was we had, we had difficulty labels for most of the issues. And the easiest one is the difficulty newcomer. This is like fix a typo. It's incredibly simple. So whenever I see a typo, I don't fix this, I file an issue. And those are the issues that can help the newcomers learn your workflow. Instead of like doing a meaningful contribution, they they just need the time to learn the workflow. Um, okay, Rasvan is not here, but he he told me like, yeah, a yeah, GNOME contributor made his first contribution in just two weeks. We can do it in a day, because um, it's it's like two things that are orthogonal. You need to learn the workflow and you need to learn the code base. If you do all at once, it's going to be incredibly complicated for the newcomer. Um, and if you have more difficulty levels, like difficulty low, medium, and high, you can actually, you can provide a ladder that people can climb up and they can grow on into your uh, project. They can grow into the code base and learn, lear learn about it. Um, you just need documentation. Um, with that, I mean like developer onboarding documentation. And we had last year a, a GSEC student who, who wasn't a GSEC student at that time who wrote a newcomer guide for us. Uh, I will show that later. And that, that helps a lot because people get a step-by-step -step guide, basically, to do the contribution and learn the workflow. And like our workflow is a bit complicated. We do all like rebases and stuff that people find confusing that are actually not that hard, but they're just not common. Um, and, and a lot of people are scared of that. 
Um, but documentation, of course, helps. Um, so the, the ability to respond quickly when something happens, I think this is very, very critical because um, if a newcomer joins a project and he asks a question, nothing happens like for hours. Um, best case is even in, it's on IRC, so the newcomer will drop out right after five minutes after asking that question. Will never receive any answer, even if there is one. Um, so what I can recommend there is, well, you, you might have an IRC bridge or a bridge from IRC, but provide something that newcomers can log into, that they get mail notifications because they are very impatient. Um, and secondly, respond as quickly as you can. And with that, I'm not saying you have to solve their problem right now. What I'm saying is like, if you see that message, you can say like, okay, I don't have time right now, but I will respond as soon as I get time or like tomorrow, in two weeks, whatever, but give them like an immediate response. And this is like, well, any, good communication. If you just give them an estimate when you have time, this is worth a lot. Um, what I think uh, is, is also very, very good, have an off-topic channel. Um, because this is, this is um, I think, one of the most active channels. Um, I had to mute it, <laughs> but... <laughs> Um, it's, there, there are incredibly funny discussions and the community really grows on an off-topic channel. I think this is, this is something you don't want to miss for your community and it, it makes the team feel like they are together in the same boat and it's, it's really improving the feeling. Um, coming to the more technical parts, um, you of course need to ensure that your code base has good quality. And what I don't recommend is being less strict with newcomers. What I recommend instead is being more strict with newcomers. Um, so the newcomers are there to learn with you. And if you, if you do reviews politely, um, you can make some GitHub templates for the most common things, right? Um, but uh, if you do it like that, and if you do it uh, the right way, then people will understand that code reviews are there to help them as well. And code reviews are not even like a one-way learning street, but they are a two-way learning street. Um, because we, as the maintainers of an open source project, can learn a lot from the newcomers as well. They have the fresh experience that uh, we lack, and we have some not-so-fresh experience that they lack, but that is also important as well. Um, this is actually like this, for example, a problem with our approach, like this generated a lot of attraction from students and we don't have a lot of experienced people. Still like we, we are like a bunch of crazy, totally motivated students and very few experienced people, <laughs> but it works out quite well. Um, next point is like, let them review source code right ahead. So what we actually do in our newcomer guide is once you have submitted your first pull request to GitHub, we recommend you go review another newcomer pull request um, based on what you read here and try identifying issues in other people's code. Because reviewing is a, is a so essential part of our community. We need that. And if, well, if they don't help us, we, don't bur we kind of burn out. Um, and if they help us, they get to learn this as well. And what we notice is that they appreciate being reviewed and they appreciate being able to review. Like a lot of people usually think, what, I am allowed to review? This is great, right? Um, you, ob you obviously don't want them to merge things autonomously, but you can let them review things and then just let, let a maintainer cross-check in the end. And have the first few iterations, then the newcomers are like a sub-community that reviews each other. And that works very, very good in my opinion. Um, you do want to provoke, promote and reward uh, achievements as far as you can. So what we are trying to do, uh, and we haven't managed to keep it up a lot lately, um, is like tweeting about great things that the new people do. Because like somebody comes in and then he writes support for another programming language in Koala, and this is, this is gorgeous. So 
we try to tweet about that because our users will want to know about that and they feel the immediate appreciation. They are, they are there as a full community member. They get reviews, they can do reviews, and they also get appreciation for the stuff that they do. Um, if you're doing this, you're basically thinking like a startup. You're optimizing for growth. And if you, if you think like a startup, you will always want to ask for feedback. It's an iterative process. And you will never reach the final truth. And neither is this the final truth, right? Um, so always ask them for feedback. And make sure that they know their opinion matters and they, you are open to listening to them if they feel like your newcomer experience could be better or anything else could be better. And um, oftentimes, uh, I think we, we even have a Google form that we send them in a templated message after their, their first issue, oftentimes. And so they can give us feedback about what we can improve about the process and the project and the usability and stuff like that. Um, so the, the last point of the uh, large introduction here, because this is not yet contributor automation, right, is um, live the spirit of the project like you want it to be. Um, I think there's like a, an expression like, uh, as a leader, your community will grow just like you are. And this is actually very true. So we, we notice like if you live those principles, the newcomers will pass on the, those principles to the next one as they grow. Um, and the, there will be this kind of mentality. I, I don't know if you can, sh can see the shape of mentality you will get from, from this kind of uh, thing, but you, it, it always influences how everything behaves. So let's see you do that. And you're drowning in newcomers. And your maintainers are burnt out. You have 60 open pull requests to review. And the number is not going to get lower. So what do you do? And then in addition, you also you have all those newcomers coming at the channel. I think yesterday we had, we had six new newcomers yesterday. Um, and they, they are asking for an invite into the organization because the GitHub permission system doesn't let you assign issues without having them invited into the organization. Then they, they want to be assigned to issues because the GitHub permission system doesn't allow you to give them access to assign themselves to issues without giving them full right access. Um, you, you need to know like where can I, can I, how can I even distinguish between pull requests that need review and the others, like if you, you need some organizational system, you can manually put labels on everything, but then a newcomer updates this for request and it gets lost forever. So this is kind of, those are the issues that, that made us drown in, in newcomers and in the work, and that I, I felt we definitely had to automate. And that's what we did. So what I want to do now is I want to take like an example newcomer experience um, at Koala, so, so you can see what is possible. And although those are only screenshots, this is like, this is the reality and this is not mocked. So the, the first thing that a newcomer does is saying, hey, I'm here. And then we do just, uh, we have a chatbot, which is Cobot, which we use to invite people. And currently only maintainers can do that because we don't want it abused. But uh, in principle, it's like, it's very, very quick. and. What this bot does is it invites them to the GitHub organization and um, it tells them, hey, we're here for you and we want to help you. Um, and at the same time, it prepares them a bit um, about like in open source, you have to be a bit careful about not asking too trivial questions that you can easily just Google and get the response in the instant response field even, right? Um, so it. This this is kind of a problem if you scale that a lot of people ask you those kinds of questions. So um, we noticed that we had to uh, tell them like think, <laughs> um, like es especially if you're giving people lots of instructions, it's easy it's easy to like stop thinking and just follow instructions, um, and that's that's not what we want. So I feel like this isn't the easy the ideal solution yet, but um, it kind of works and people know, yes, um, I'm joining something here. Um, 
they do still feel appreciated. They, they don't feel like uh, we're annoying them with this because, because this is actually uh, like useful, useful stuff for your life, right? You, you can Google things. Um, so what they do uh, next is they use this newcomer guide and the important thing that I want to point out is that we, um, we do encourage them and we do make clear, like, if you only do a newcomer issue with us, this is going to be a lot of work with us. And if you look to contribute to open source, that's not it. Um, the newcomer guide is just like, it's, it's a service from us to get you started. And it, it is a lot of work and it gets us a few typos fixed well, but we could usually fix them faster than filing that issue. Um, so please stick around at least for like one relevant change. Um, it doesn't mean that newcomers issues are made up. I mean, they, they are real issues, right? But um, oh, should I, I shouldn't have put so much text on the slide. I'm sorry. Um, everyone is reading. Um, yeah, and it also encourages you right ahead to do code reviews. Um, so what they do next is they visit koala.io slash new. And I think this is actually one of the most important things here. We have short links for everything. Like, um, if I started, when I started at GNOME, I, I got from my mentor like a huge three paragraph link where I could find issues that would be low difficulty. And it was a custom filter for that project and who knows in Bugzilla. And this is like, I think he's ev he was every time compiling this link again and again and again. This costs a lot of time and it isn't really accessible because I had to personally approach him just to get like the list of low difficulty issues. And um, what we did was we made, um, and this is actually um, Simone who isn't here right now, but he's at the conference. So um, when I was in Brno, I met Simone and he, he was like, hey, let's, let's set up short links. And they were so awesome. Like every newcomer immediately knows where he can go. It's koala.io slash new. There I can find all the newcomer issues that are unassigned. Um, you, you can find the newcomer guide at koala.io slash newcomer. That's trivial. And, and it makes everything accessible. So this is like this filter and this essentially the, the short link just gives you the filter, the organization wide filter for newcomer issues. Uh, sometimes we have more, sometimes we have less. Um, and then you basically want to take an issue and that you can do with the bot. The nice thing with this bot is it's like the S flag of a Unix executable, right? You can give people permission to do certain things in certain contexts but not generally give them all permissions. Um, so the, the assignment obviously assigns the newcomer, but what's important here is that the bot will refuse to assign a newcomer a second newcomer issue. Because that is when newcomers, like they, they get this feeling of, yay, I did something from the first newcomer issue and they want to do it again. But they, at least some newcomers don't feel like they, they are ready for the next step but the goal of this newcomer issue is just to learn the workflow and they usually are ready for the next step. And it is, I think, very important to make sure that people are not like using up all the newcomer issues and using this service again and again and again, because it's a lot of work for the community. Um, so this kind of automation also is like, is, I think this is a huge prevention of burning out. Like this is probably the, the most important part that you don't give people to newcomer issues. Um, so you make a pull request, um, you get a template. Um, and I think one important thing here to know is like, I mentioned, we have like this process, we want to make commits beautiful. We want to do rebases and stuff. And sometimes contributors just come around and want to quickly fix something. And they are not interested in like doing a long-term contribution. They don't want to learn all the process of Koala or of your project. So I think it's very important to offer them right in their template. Like, hey, if you're just an external person looking to fix something really quick, you can skip this. We can do it for you because we know what it just takes a few minutes 
Um, but if you're not, you got to learn this. Um, and I think now, now it gets interesting because we have an automatic code review. Um, we have a lot of common first issues, which are commit messages. Um, you can see in this, in this commit message up there, uh, right to the top, there's a space before the colon, and that's not so nice. Well, we didn't want that. Um, that's just not consistent, right? And it's, it's very easy to follow this rule, but you get to know it. And um, you have more trivial issues, uh, like here, the line is just too long. And, and those are like, those are issues that are pretty boring to check for um, with this bot, which is Gitmite, which is um, the, well, at some point I was like working f more or less full time on Koala and I was thinking, okay, there got to be a w better way of uh, maybe getting some money and making a living of this. So I'm, I'm working on founding this as a startup. But what you see here will be the MIT licensed open source version. So I think I'm allowed to talk about that here. Um, and essentially, you, you will get a code review using Koala itself on your source code. And in a lot of cases, you will also get a, a patch, some clear instructions on how to fix that issue. Um, I think this is, this is really good because the messages you get are much better than if a developer comes by and says, read the fucking manual. Um, they are very concrete. They give you hints like this is exactly wrong and they save you a lot of time as maintainers because those trivial issues, like usually all newcomers do like two, three iterations just on their own with the bot. Um, and, and I think this is a really, really great part. Um, then we have the code review from the developers. And here we again have a short link, koala.io slash review, right? What the bot always does is it takes care of marking pull requests pending review. You see here, the labeling is done automatically. It, it gives it a size label. It gives it a pending review label. And a reviewer can set it to, to WIP using our chatbot even if he doesn't have right access to the repository. And once the, the newcomer or the contributor pushes again, it gets set to pending review automatically. So you don't need to manage which pull requests are actually pending review. And you can just go to that link and get started reviewing directly because you, you get only those pull requests that need a review. Um, in the end, we have actually a merge bot so uh, we automatically do PyPI releases with that, um, which is, I think, very satisfactory for newcomers because their changes are there to test without having to install it from source. They can just get the pre-release and their changes are in there. And I think this is like an, an incredible satisfaction part. So what is the next step? A newcomer is very heavily involved with your with your project and um, you told them, hey, do more than a newcomer issue. Uh, you you got to provide some motivation sometimes. Um, and what we do is we just promote them to developers. It's more of a symbolic act. It's like you are a serious part of our community now. You are not a, a newcomer who is still like in the in the learning phase. You You know how to do stuff and we trust you. And this is like, we invite people to the developers group. Um, I, I think this is actually very, very relevant psychologically for uh, for everyone. And it's like the, the additional like attribution, like you did a great job here. Um, I, so I, I can totally recommend that even if it doesn't come with uh, additional rights or, or technical things. It's just a, a sign of appreciation. Um, I think this was the, the most important parts of the automation that we do. Um, I, I will just very, very quickly summarize it and then I will be open for any questions. So try to automate maintenance tasks. See what do you do often inviting newcomers. That, that was so awful because I had to do it because you need an administration account to invite people to your organization. Um, and you don't want like all the maintainers to be administrators on GitHub. Ideally, you want nobody to be administrator except some bot that does the job. 
Um, so look out for things that you can automate, um, and you will easily find some. And writing like a simple chatbot with Hubot, that's, that's like a two-hour effort. It's really simple. Uh, get rid of trivial issues. Uh, that's what we're working on on Gitmate. Um, if, if you are interested in that, like, let us know. We are always looking for feedback and on how we can make it better. I'm also doing some interviews here at the conference um, to like find out what, what the problems are that developers have in their workflow that we can automate. And make everything easily accessible. For example, you will find a summary of all links that we have on koala.io slash links. Where else, right? Um, so, if you want to know more about those tools that we do use, um, gitmate.io is like the website of the code review bot, and gitlab.com slash koala slash cobot is our chatbot, which is a hubot with a few scripts. Um, it can also transform English text into ghetto English text. <laughs> um, so, so, but feel free to use it. Um, and, and fork it, and maybe I, I would love to make Cobot, for example, uh, more generic so it can apply to other organizations because I, I haven't seen a chatbot that is like that targeted to open source organizations yet, and I think that would be easily possible. Um, yes, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Um, I hope this was helpful. Uh, if you have any feedback, I would like to hear it right now because I didn't, I, I, I didn't like just send it as a question. Um, you know, I, I always like to iterate on things. Um, and I'm going to put up the URLs as well. So if you are interested in like using one of those automations for your open source project, you know where to look for. And then I would be open for any questions. have it on uh, screen, unfortunately. I, I can put it on the screen. Um, I am not sure, like, I feel like the open source world lacks good tools for security analysis. Koala does include the, the ones that we found, and we have them in Koala. Um, so I, I am not sure what usable means. Um, I think at the moment, like with open source tools, you will have the easiest time using Koala, probably. Um, and I, I don't know what else I would recommend, except uh, there, there's, of course, proprietary tools, uh, which are specific for that purpose, which can, at the moment, I think, do a, do a better job. Okay. Uh, next question is, uh, is Gitmate also supported uh, on GitLab? Um, Gitmate, so what we have, Gitmate currently is a prototype, and we are working on the new version. Uh, on the, the MIT license community thing, and it will be supported on GitLab. We expect it to be working in just about like 1.5 months, roughly. Um, but if there's anyone wanting to contribute, then that can be sped up, I think. Um, I, mm -hmm. I, I think you uh, tell us, uh, it's, uh, do you automate uh, labeling uh, GitHub issues, uh, code reviewing, uh, comment patterns, or something else? So, okay. Um, so I am not fully sure what's meant here by code reviewing common patterns. We do automate GitHub issue labeling, actually. And what we do is we look for uh, keywords in your uh, issue description to automatically try it, your issues, and give it some initial set of labels. And if it's wrong, then the maintainer can just go and fix it. And like the Gitmate will not interfere with that. But um, we, we also have like some automation. Um, 
what, what we do in terms of code reviewing is we actually do an, an analysis of the history um, and we check the history for bug fix commits, which contains like fixes URL. And uh, we identify those pieces of code which are, which are correlated to those bug fixes. And with that information, we actually uh, find out heuristical which parts of your codes are more risky for bugs than others. And uh, we are doing currently some research on that, um, or, or we have done some research on that. And with the new algorithm, um, like if you look at the 0.5% of riskiest lines, you will find 40% of the upcoming bugs in the next 200 commits. If you like go back 200 commits, then you do the analysis and then check how good was it. So we actually have like a, a risk analysis and based on that, we also apply like uh, this pull request is very risky label. Um, please review it very, very carefully. Thank you very much. Uh, next question is why, why uh, oops, sorry, <laughs> I tied it. Why, why do you speak uh, in English? Um, I don't know. Like, I, I, I actually, I, I had sucked at English a long time, I think. Um, just, I, I went to a lot of conferences recently um, within, within the past years because I enjoyed very, very much talking to so much different people. And I, I usually pick out like the, uh, the British accents because I like them. And I, I actually actively try to, to do that sometimes, um, speaking a bit like not with, not such that people can actually hear I'm from Germany because the German accent is so horrible. <laughs> It was a great talk, uh, and somebody uh, was very cool the this week, so I think they appreciated it. Thank That's great. Uh, thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs>